Welcome to interviews of notables and influencers. This is Joanne Tan. I am the CEO of 10 Plus Brand. Today, I am so honored to have Patrick Geddes, the author of Transparent Investing, a fascinating book, by the way, and a very successful investment expert. So the key point is the emperor has no clothes. If you ever, <laughs> if you ever invested in the stock market, if you ever deal with any advisor, you don't want to miss this interview. After reading Patrick Geddes' book, Transparent Investing, cover to cover, word by word, and chatting with him, I am impressed by his factual approach based on research and numbers and his sense of humor and what we both have in common, and that is acting like the child who pointed out the emperor has no clothes. So with 40 years of finance experience, Patrick Geddes have managed from zero to 42 billion at the end of 2020 as the founder and CEO of Aperio, which was acquired by BlackRock for 1.05 billion. Patrick adhered to broadest based passive investment with indexing back in 1999, long before the sea change in favor of stock indexing in 2012. Now, indexing has become common and widespread, growing from 13% of U.S. equity mutual funds assets in 1998 to over 50% in 2019. By the way, this change is not motivated merely to protect consumers, but mainly from the point of protecting against the lowest revenue streams from unnecessary active investing customized version of direct indexing and tax law harvesting. These two concepts were invented by Mr. Gaddis. And you can read about it in his eye-opening book. Very easy to read, Transparent Investing. It's releasing today. It has many surprises, such as, number one is, I call it de-pedestalizing. <laughs> uh, the mystique of advisors wealth managers. Also, um, I came away with this nugget about the fiduciary relationship, which is like attorney client, or you are the investor, the customer, the, the consumer, and with your financial advisor. You know, it is asymmetrical power balance. It's not a balance, as a matter of fact, okay? So I will share some of my personal experience as well. So some of the gems here, there are lots of gems, but what impresses me is number one, quote, you are more in danger of getting hoodwinked by an investment strategy that's too fancy than by one that's too simple. Active trails passive by about 1% per year in lost returns. The wealth or financial advisors get paid a lot more by pandering the unwary consumers and investors with quote unquote chocolate cake rather than a broccoli. The broccoli is a low cost, according to Patrick, low cost, highly effective, broad based funds, very simple. Okay. And number two, simple portfolios of three to four index funds can deliver a great investment solution without much administrative burden at all. Uh, he, he brilliantly illustrated this concept with oil change. Changing your oil every three months is a lot messier than time consuming monitoring a simple portfolio of index funds, which might require a couple of hours every one to two years, just one to two years, a couple of hours, and without getting your clothes greasy, okay? <laughs> and the other thing is he, um, uh, Gad has mentioned about some alarm bells should go off when an advisor talk only about the benefits of strategy and not the trade-offs. When you feel pushed by an investor to buy certain product, financial products. And also tax is very important. You need to think about the tax consequence because that can undermine the ROI, okay? Oh, there are so many nuggets. You know, here's another example. Uh, so, quote, Patrick said this, I've encountered consumers who balk at writing a check for $2,000 for a retainer, but remain perfectly content to pay $12,000 in fees as a percentage of assets because it's hidden away. 
So you don't fully understand how the process work. Okay, so Patrick acting like total the dog pulls back the curtains in the Wizard of Oz to show what's behind the fees and active versus passive portfolio management in a transparent investing movement. First question, Patrick, what motivated you to write this book, to pull back the curtain and air the so-called dirty laundry of investment managers? So there was two reasons that, that led me to, to write the book. One was just a personal motivation that I've been very, very fortunate in my career, very well treated, and I felt something of an obligation to repay a very generous universe. The other big driver is I just have a visceral uh, negative reaction to dishonesty. And I think there's a lot of dishonesty in the investment world. There's some great services offered, but there's a lot of, uh, as you said, uh, uh, pretending that the emperor has clothes on. Okay. Do you believe the stock market is inherently risky or inherently safe? Do you believe that the stock market is a zero-sum game? There are always winners and losers. So it is very risky. And no matter what it's been doing recently, investors should always view the stock market as very risky. But it's a great, great place to invest for the very long term. I'm talking sort of 10, 20 years and longer. It's incredibly good for those, uh, those time horizons. In terms of being a zero sum game, the active management piece is a zero sum game in that the return you earn as an investor pursuing active strategies on average means you do not have as much money. Your portfolio is lighter because you've been paying all those fees. And so in that sense, it is a zero sum game. Okay. So you talk about uh, it's a good long-term place, the market uh, for, for growth, for wealth accumulation. So what do you mean by the word market? Is it a collection of rational and irrational investors, passive and active traders, speculators, analysts, institutional consumer investors, collectively making up and down movements. Right. So uh, you you summarize it really well with it's everybody. It's all players. It's institutional retail. It's active passive. And the one of the biggest challenges an investor faces is how our brains are wired to presume we can control things that we actually can't. And stock returns, active stock returns are or stock returns in general are basically random. They are not easy to predict. The industry has a terrible track record predicting either whether the stock market's going to be up or down or which stocks are going to do better. So that leads to what's called passive investing or indexing, which sounds to most investors as too passive. It sounds like, why, why wouldn't I try and make more money? The problem is that when you try to make more money, the math, the research, the statistics show you actually end up with less. And that's a really hard concept to, uh, to internalize because we're not designed for what's called probabilistic thinking. That's just part of our evolution. Okay. So about the illusion of control, people assume they have control over the market. Now, do you agree that what ultimately controls market swinging is human uh, amygdalas? part of the brain, the fear and greed. And people keep saying that two factors drive the market, fear and greed, okay? Yeah. Uh, that's like seeking highs, like a gambler, right? Uh, yes, although you have to be careful that gambling has, for all consumers, has a, a, a negative expected return. You go to Las Vegas, hundreds of people go to Las Vegas, on average, they're going to lose a little bit. That's the same as, as active management. So to say that the market is driven entirely by the amygdala is a, a bit of an overstatement, it, but emotions matter enormously. What I try and argue in, in my book is that many people presume that investing is about really good analysis, learning the tricks, learning the, the hot tips that let you make a killing. And I would argue that it's actually healthy behavior. And often that means doing nothing. That's what makes you really rich. And that's why it's so counterintuitive. Most people believe that the wealth managers, the financial advisors, know more than themselves. And they have certain 
education and skill sets that make them better able to control the market. Your book said otherwise. So why do you think those active stock picking kind of investment is more risky and have lower return? And what are more controllable? So it, it the, the active management isn't really riskier. It's not any riskier than the overall stock market. What's risky is thinking you're going to outperform and that it's worth paying all that those extra fees. So the lower returns, why do I believe that? Because the research is so overwhelming. It's not as though there are a few little articles here and there and sort of uh, a, a debate around, well, does active really uh, do worse than, than indexing? The answer is absolutely. So the, the data very, very powerfully uh, support this idea. And, and you also mentioned that um, investors think that investment advisors know more than the investors do. That's actually true. Investment advisors do have a lot of skills, a lot of training, a lot of knowledge. What they are good at doing is advising on on setting up portfolios, on holding people's hands through down markets, on sort of one-off explanations of difficult financial decisions. What they're bad at, and the thing I criticize, is when they pretend they know how to predict the future. And when, back to the Wizard of Oz analogy, when, when Dorothy accuses the wizard after he's been uh, uh, debunked, as it were, she says, you're a very bad man. And he says, no, I'm a good man. I'm just a bad wizard. And that analogy explains the investment industry so well, because the investment industry's advisors, most of them are very honorable, ethical people, <clears throat> do have a lot of value to add, but stop pretending you know how to predict the future. Put away your crystal ball. And that is a big problem because what's a very uncomfortable reality is that investment advice the investment advisors are frightened that if they if their clients realize that we can't predict the future that they won't pay all those high fees and that's a, that's a valid concern so it's a very tricky nuanced situation where it's not like this entire industry is unethical or doing bad things it's just a piece of pretending that you can either time or beat the market that's where the evidence is so overwhelmingly uh, contradictory and they're, they're awful at it. I think investment advisors add a lot of value on those other things I was mentioning. Well, in your book, you mentioned that there are two options for average consumers. One is to do it yourself and the other is go with a wealth advisor. So Correct. if I were to select index funds without the so-called load fees charged by some um, advisors, if I... I'm going to select it myself. What do I need to watch out for? So the, let me start with the, that choice. And you, you mentioned a great challenge and an issue of, should I try and do this myself or should I hire someone? And what I have in the book, and there's a, a free version of that, um, that recommendation or that, a guide to that on my website. Um, the, the, the challenge is knowing what services you actually want to buy if you think you just can't handle it, it's too much work, that I would push back on. It can be incredibly simple. If you want certain things explained or some more complicated situations, um, if you want some advice, not on the future, but on like financial planning, that's a really valid reason. So the more you want those sorts of things, the more you should lean toward hiring someone. Back to your question about should you do it yourself, the more you just need to, to uh, set up a portfolio and monitor it yourself, that is the part that's actually much easier to do than most people might think. And you can build really, really simple portfolios of one, two, three, four um, very simple mutual funds with all indexing on the stock side. And I explain how to do that. So I don't say everyone should do it yourself. There are a lot of investors where that's not the right choice. But I think most investors don't get a chance to hear really good advice around, should I do this myself or should I hire someone? Most of the stuff you read is from the industry. And of course, they have a revenue vested interest in this and they want business. We, we want people to pay us. And so there's a kind of disingenuous, you don't want to try this on your own. 
I, the data do not support that. On the other hand, there's a kind of cynical view of, ah, it's all snake oil salespeople. It's a ripoff industry. Stay away from Wall Street. It's only for the rich and powerful. That's not, that's not true either. That's too cynical. So it's a tricky challenge to try and figure out whether to do it yourself or hire someone. And it's really about knowing who you are. And that's, that's, there's some uh, help in that guide I mentioned on my website. Yes, I found that guide very helpful. Uh, let's assume that I choose to hire someone. Uh, now here is a very sensitive issue because I don't want to appear like a pain, not like someone who doesn't trust the advisor, okay? So when I approach an advisor, I want him to feel that I trust him. And I, I don't feel like I should ask too aggressively, what are your fees? What are your hidden fees? I mean, that's kind of a offensive in and of itself. And I don't want to be like a, a micromanaging, appearing, I know everything and I don't. So between the line of blind trust and yep. the hesitation of not offending someone who's managing my money, all my retirement, yep. but also being empowered to ask the right questions. Yep. I mean, what's your advice? So I, I would shift your framing of that situation. It's a really good question because you're, you're, you're kind of getting at the core of that relationship between a wealth advisor and, and a client. And I would uh, urge everyone to take the same consumer mindset into that relationship that they would take at the grocery store. So let's say you're shopping at the grocery store and you're in the produce section and they're avocados, which look delicious, or broccoli. But there's no price on it. And you ask for the price and you're told, well, let us handle that. And of course, any shopper would just say, that's ridiculous. What are you talking about? I'm not going to buy this unless I know what the price is. So I would suggest that it's very beneficial to overcome uh, wariness around asking about the fees the same way you would at a grocery store. I certainly support where you're going with this uh, uh, suggested on the, on the interaction, that you not come in hostile and, and aggressive, but find out what's really going on. And it's also a good way to learn how open, how transparent a potential advisor is. The more they want to steer you away from talking about fees and talking about their actual track record, those are red flags. That's not a good thing. Any good advisor will want you to be very, very clear on all the fees. And it is a bad sign when there are fees you didn't know about. And most investors, or it's very common for an investor not to understand all the fees. There are so many ways to hide uh, ways the investment industry makes money. So don't come in as a complete cynic, but you use the word empowered. To be a really empowered consumer, you do need to have the confidence that it's appropriate to ask about what services that, the, that you need and what the advisor actually offers and how they get paid for it. And if you hear how they get paid for it and you make a decision as a consumer that that's worth it, that's a perfectly fine decision. What I'm objecting to and urging consumers to avoid is a mindset of, well, I don't understand investing and I trust my advisor and I just I leave it to, to her or to him. That's not a very healthy attitude. That's not empowering. But that doesn't mean you come out with guns blazing, very hostile. Um, but you do want to figure out how they make their money. And you do need to push back on certain questions like a classic is, Joanne, I'm going to put you in these um, strategies, these active stock strategies. Look over the last five years. They've beaten the market. Patrick Geddes may say you can't do that. Here's proof you can I don't say you can't do that. I just say on average, they don't. And the, the data are unequivocally support my pr uh, position. There's, there's no way to argue against all that data. So you hear that and think, well, that sounds great. The empowered question is, okay, you've picked the ones that have done well historically. Do you keep track of how well they do after you pick them, after you recommend them? And if an advisor says no, that's a bad sign because it means I don't really care how you do. I just need to sell you on this. 
And the fact that most of these active strategies that do beat the market tend not to uh, in, in following periods. It, it's, it's fairly close to random. So I would consider that as empowered, but you raise a really valid point that you still need to be a respectful uh, consumer. And there is a lot of knowledge and expertise that investment advisors uh, bring to that, those relationships. Right. So you said the numbers and statistics do not support those who maybe um, have beaten the market once or twice will continue to do so. Exactly. It's, it's, it's completely the opposite. You know, Correct. nobody can really rely on any advisor's past track record for predicting the future. That's and just that's, not plausible. That's why you need to ask them, what is your track record after you've made the recommendations? And the odds are they won't keep track of that. And you should ask yourself, why aren't they tracking the number that really matters to me? And are they just trying to sell me something? So active management is not this sin that should be avoided at all costs, but there's no way around the fact that the, the data and the fact that on average, the active management industry has destroyed value for its investors. There is no disputing that. That is absolutely locked down. Now, you cannot say no one ever beats the market. That's also false. So it's, it's a little tricky. That's what the book's about, is trying to teach investors the stuff they really need rather than selling them on, on something very sexy. Right. So after reading your book, I was empowered to ask the, not the tough questions, but the right questions when I was looking for an advisor. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did ask about fees and I, and they said, uh, I will never tell you who, okay. They said it's about $8,000 a year. Okay. And it's almost 1% of the entire RO return. Okay. okay. The entire asset value yep. or whatever you call it. And then, uh, and I said, well, uh, what do you do? Okay. Uh, what do I, what benefit do I get? Because I'm interested in just simple, broad-based, inexpensive index funds, you know, as your book recommended, you know, like I can get it from Vanguard. I can get it from Schwab. Why should I pay you that much money every year? Uh, and for the same uh, index funds and his answers were, uh, we give you a tax advice, which I appreciate very much. We give you uh, strategies and portfolio and allocation strategies. And, oh, great, I like that. And he said, you know, and everything you get from us, uh, you get cheaper. I said, how come? Because we, as a uh, a firm, we have a total of like uh, hundreds of millions of assets, so we can buy some institutional funds that you cannot access, like Cal Perks or whatever. Yep. Yep. And then uh, you can uh, have a so-called uh, interval funds, which is like bridging my lack of capacity to access those kind of uh, big funds through their firm. Okay. And that was very enticing. I was immediately attracted because who doesn't want to get, uh, get access to some privileged funds or uh, with, with my limited resource, even billionaires and millionaires, they hunt for bargains just like me. What do you think of that? So the comment that everything they offer you is cheaper than you could get it yourself, that's pretty clearly a false statement. Do they have some strategies that they can get cheaper for you than you could get yourself? Yes. But here's where the tricky part of the, the dangle of the lure in front of you in that sales conversation is, why is it necessarily better to get one of those rarefied offerings? Just because it's rare doesn't mean it's good. And one of the points I make in the book is what, that there's a myth that the very wealthy uh, know how to get great investment advice. And I've been in the business of advising the ultra high net worth, meaning people with sort of 50 million in assets and up. And I can assure you that some of them are very smart and a lot of them are very easily played by their advisors. It's, it's not a guarantee you know how to do things. So what you were getting dangled in front of you was prestige that may actually have no value. Like, so what if you're investing alongside Jeff Bezos? That doesn't make it a smart strategy. And so you need to be very careful when you're being fed 
uh, the, 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 the sex appeal of I, either active management in general or this kind of elite um, special, you're, you're, you're in a higher grade and we're going to get you in on some great deals that others might not have access to. The first thing in your mind should be, do I want to be in those? Why does that matter? And if they're claiming they are cheaper on their indexing, they're almost certainly misleading you. Well, thank you so much. I, I, this is really helpful. So uh, my friend, Jonathan Lighty, a 401k expert, had two questions for you through me. Okay, The first is, what is your view regarding the value of active asset allocation specifically? There are many advisors now who use close to 100% passive investments. However, their asset allocation, i.e. their mix of said products, is still by definition active. Is that also active management? And if so, does that kind of active management work any better? A uh, short answer is no. <laughs> um, it's a great distinction. It's one I make in the book. The, the difference between uh, in the active passive discussion that applies to two separate areas. One is basically which stocks are you going to pick? Indexing is you pick all of them. You, you weight it the way the market is. You are the market. Active is you're picking the stocks that are going to outperform. Active asset allocation is about changing your, your, your asset weights. Like the market looks really overvalued now. I'm going to move up my allocation to bonds and cash because I don't trust where the stock market is. I'm going to bring that back up once the stock market has, has uh, uh, cooled off. That is very active asset allocation. And again, the data are, I'll use the same adverb, overwhelmingly against the capacity to do that. Doesn't mean there's no one who ever does smart asset allocation, but as an industry, it's awful. And it's the same for institutional investment. The active asset allocation is as fruitless and expensive a venture as active stock picking. So I would completely agree that um, you need to watch out for both varieties of being sold a capability and a skill that simply doesn't exist. Or it does not exist consistently. It's, it's rare. Do you think sometimes you need to, quote unquote, micro adjust, tweaking or rebalance the portfolio? On that, I would urge everyone to avoid that. That's the temptation of eating chocolate cake. And there's a, there's a, a weird paradox about the best way to invest for most people is it sounds so uh, much like you're surrendering to fate. But the weird part is this is a situation where surrendering to fate makes you a lot richer. You're talking over a 30-year time horizon. I have some numbers in the book. You throw in the extra fees you pay to wealth managers. If you're only hiring them to pick active strategies, you throw out all the active fee costs and the, the tax burden, especially if you're high income. Over a 30-year period, you can have twice as much money with this very simple indexed approach. And that's got to be the grounding part of... Um, uh, of anyone's uh, investment plan. And the problem is, uh, and I've heard advisors say, the reason they need to hire, of a, hire us is people are constantly tweaking their portfolios. And that's a really valid point. Most people are tempted to tweak their portfolios, like in a market downturn. It just sounds as though um, uh, everything's going to hell in a handbasket, and I, I, I cannot endure this. That's actually when you need to do nothing or other insights that seem very defensible. I was on a, a, a webinar a couple months ago, and someone said that they had completely divested from the Chinese economy because it was clearly going to collapse and be a disaster. And I, I have no idea if the Chinese economy is going to be very strong or collapse. It may be a valid concern, but this is back to a comment you made earlier. When you as an investor 
act as though you are smarter than that $95 trillion of public equity around the globe, that's when you get yourself in trouble. And so I would very strongly urge people to avoid the urge, the craving to tweak. It's doing nothing that makes people really rich. And that just sounds so crazy, but the math, it, 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 it's, it's so proven. The problem is we're not wired kind of emotionally and experientially for that to be the case. Because in so many other parts of life, doing nothing is a really bad thing. But with investing, once you set a really good asset allocation and you've got it in really low cost funds, like the great thing about index funds is you never have to check how they're doing against the market. They are the market. So if the market's down 10%, your index fund's going to be down 10%. But don't tweak it. That's that's the success story. And it just sounds so counter to who we are and how our brains work. Right. And there are some other rules. Uh, um, I, I want to clarify uh, what you said in general as a principle. Yes, it makes sense. Okay. But let's say my asset allocation, it's not exact allocation. I'm just for the sake of the uh, yep. example. Yep. Uh, let's say I have 60% in stocks and yep. uh, now 60 spent in stock 40 percent in bonds okay sure yep. and and among the 60 percent, there is this uh roth ira which is after tax money so i put them yep. in the more um uh, more risky area uh, yep. to let it grow over the years yep. now when the market is down isn't it better to buy stocks while they're cheap uh after selling some bonds to rebalance the portfolio yeah, so, so rebalancing is a very valid and important concept, and advisors can even tell you that they help enforce that. And I, and I write in the book about what's the right level of adjusting to do on the fly, and I actually argue for what are called pretty wide bands, meaning you're 60-40 if the stock market's way down um, and, and it, you say it drops to where it's 50-50, it's you've done nothing. Uh, the math definitely supports rebalancing. Rebalancing is a very positive discipline. Uh, I think that's a big ask to suggest that not only should people not sell out, but they should also um, readjust constantly. Now, you can also get very simple packaged funds that do everything or called target retirement or, or, or other uh, all asset class funds that do that rebalancing for you. And that can be a great thing. So rebalancing is a good thing. The problem is when people rebalance, the temptation comes in that you make adjustments based on where you see the market. And yes, it's good to buy stocks when they're cheaper, but it's not good to think you know when they're cheaper. And that sounds a little contradictory because it's the Overconfidence, the illusion of control, the supposition that you know how to time the market, that's what gets you into trouble. Rebalancing is a very healthy, good thing. And advisors would claim they can help with that. And I, I would agree that that can be uh, one of the benefits of an advisor, but it's very easy to get that uh, kind of automated through like a, a, a retirement uh, type fund. Right. So in the common retirement index funds, they have it built in automatically. Correct. So when the stock market falls by a certain percentage, yep. they automatically, and yes. your portfolio is no longer 60%, they automatically will bring it back. Yep. Bring it back by yep. itself. I don't yep. need to, or the financial advisor Correct. doesn't need to micromanage. Correct. And, and that's, then, that's a debate around, uh, even Vanguard has this issue and they've taken some criticism for, and they're a very ethical firm, but they've got this, advisory business and even they have the ethical conundrum of is their advisor business able to provide more than some of their own target retirement funds and that's a tricky question so it's it's a very slippery slope where uh, there's a great quote i use in my book it's quite uh, famous from a muckraker a, a, a investigative journalist from the early 20th century named upton sinclair and he said it is very difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. And that's so applicable to the investment industry where 
people look at the advice they're getting from the investment industry, and some of it's really good. There are a lot of real experts. There's a lot of good advice. There's a lot of uh, research. There's some great um, nuggets there. The problem is you need to look at the investment industry as in danger of preferring you buy the things that give it the most revenue. That's why for my book, I started getting asked, well, aren't you just selling something? You want people to buy your book. And the way I got rid of that problem for this book is I'm donating all the proceeds to a nonprofit that does financial literacy work. Why? Because I wanted to separate out the danger of my motivation from the quality of the advice. And I want consumers of anything, you should be careful in what you hear from me or anyone, careful in that don't be so cynical that you ignore good advice, but be very, very cautious and careful around the economic incentive of anyone giving you advice on investing. Right, because big firms like Morgan Stanley, and uh, they have the incentive they have the inherit, I would say, some kind of conflict of interest of selling their financial products rather than absolutely, yeah, uh, similar products by offered by others. So uh, we we just have to be informed and ask questions. Don't be bashful about you know knowing the facts. You it's your right. This is the only power we have. So you said about this uh, automatically triggered that targeted retirement funds, and that is that called a passive asset allocation, this automatic triggering? Uh, uh, yes. Yeah, I, I, I define passive asset allocation as you keep it fairly constant. And, and it's a little more complicated than that because those funds are also designed as you age and go through life, eventually they start uh, lowering the, the, uh, the stock exposure, lowering the overall risk. Right. But that, that discipline of the rebalancing Mm-hmm. is very easy to get at basically no extra cost through one of those funds. And those funds aren't, aren't for everyone. They're, they're very much designed for retirement accounts, so they don't take the tax issues uh, into account. So people with high incomes, for example, might not want to own them in a taxable account because they'd be better off with municipal bonds than the taxable bonds that, that are always in those accounts. So it can get a little, a little nuanced, but as a concept, those funds are a great place to start. And, and, and lots of firms offer them. The, when people are looking at them, you wanna bring the same uh, criteria you bring to looking at any investment, look very carefully at the fees and you wanna make sure there's no extra fee for the overall packaging. There's no point in paying that. And that all the underlying funds are very, very low cost. That's the way to shop for one of those. Thank you so much. Now, someone else brought up another concept. Um, it's that when the market is down, and for those who have high net worth, the uh, capital gain tax is uh, quite uh, significant. But because in your book, you said it many times, when the market is down, sit tight, don't do anything, sit tight, don't do anything. But they said, well, you can realize the capital gain reduction, the tax, reducing the tax, by selling when the market is down and then buy an equivalent similar uh, fund like uh, you know Vanguard and Schwab, they, they offer similar funds. And then you buy a similar fund at Schwab after you dumped uh, Vanguard. So you realize the, the decrease in capital gain tax and you are not really losing. What you're describing is called tax loss harvesting. And I've been in that business for, for over 20 years. Um, and it's a very effective strategy. And you do need to be careful. Like, like if you buy the same index fund, I would argue that that's not something IRS is going to or should allow. Like selling a, uh, let's say it's a, a, an S&P 500 index fund at one company and buying an S&P 500 index fund at another, that's not something you should do if you're, you're booking loss. But you can buy similar things. So in those cases, you are not changing your asset allocation. You're not buying or selling stocks when they're cheap. You are simply reallocating from one instrument to another and realizing losses you may have. That's not making an active asset allocation call. That's not making a a stock picking active call. That's simply 
booking a loss and staying at the same level of market exposure. That's a very, very different thing from active asset allocation. Okay. So another question by my friend, Jonathan Lighty, the 401k expert is, why is it so difficult to identify in advance active managers that will beat their respective indexes or passive peers? Uh, it's a great question. I mean, there, there are a number of different ways you can answer that. One is it's difficult because on average, they don't. It, it just, you just go back to the empirical data. I heard one uh, professor once uh, uh, quip that in the debate between indexing and active, the indexers have an unfair advantage. They have what are the equivalent of nuclear weapons in that war in the data. The data are just so powerfully against active. So the question, how come it's so hard? It's because the odds are so stacked against it. It's almost like ask, being asked, well, why is it if I bet at a roulette wheel and I put a chip down on one number that it hardly ever comes up? Well, the odds are one out of 38 that it'll ever come up. It's a very clear statistical number. And so to be asked, why is it so hard? It's because, you could say it's because of the fees, you could say it's because statistically it's a low probability bet and that's why it's so hard to get it right. You know, I remember uh, right after college, some friends, you know, who got this, that's back in 80s, okay? Late 80s, got this very glamorous job in Merrill Lynch and Morgan Stanley and they're financial analysts and they work long hours doing research, analyzing, and stay on top of the market news, new developments, and all that. But do you think that's a waste of time? In your book, you said, you know, you just check your portfolio every five years or maybe every three years or two years and just sit tight and be stoic. I feel like, wow. So all that youth and time and efforts are basically what they were doing was not producing any value. Well, well right. It, it, what they were doing was supporting an industry that has destroyed value. What I like about what you just said is that I'm arguing to be stoic. And you've said this in other conversations. I had it was a great insight into what the book is really about is a different mindset. It sounds a little pretentious. You could almost say a different philosophy. And it's very much a different mindset of look at what you can actually control. I, in the book, I talk about the, the, the very famous serenity prayer, where you're asking to be granted the serenity to accept the things you cannot change. That would include things like when the stock market goes up and down, which stocks are going to do better than the stock market? the uh, courage to change the things I can't. What can you control? You can control fees. You can control your taxes and the wisdom to tell the difference. That's what the book is about, is trying to share that wisdom about what you can control and what you can't control. And it, there is a sort of stoicism or a, a Buddhist stay grounded. Don't, don't just do something, sit there. and. The hard part about that is one, you have an entire industry, you have an entire financial media that's where that's anathema. Like we need a lot of excitement and activity and clickbait to sell things. The industry says that, the financial media say that. The reality for an investor is the best choice is to do nothing and to set up a good asset allocation. And as I said, just look at it every two or three years. And that's, that's hard in the sense of a, a lot of these spiritual or philosophical disciplines like Stoicism or, or Buddhism do take a lot of discipline because you're countering the natural inclination of our brains to chatter and activity. And investing is just like other parts of life where the, the, the chatter and, and the feeling on top of things feels good emotionally. The problem is it's bad for our portfolio. I mean, you are touching about this psychological, cultural, uh, the human emotional flaws. And yeah. because we feel like we feel better when we are too active, we're busy, busy yep. doing things. We're in control. We're on top of things. You know, think of a, 
of a coach or a self-help book saying, you need to be really passive, Joanne, in your life, you should just sit back and let life come to you. Can you imagine writing a self-help book like that? It would, it would be silly. It would almost be a satire, right? And, and I'm not arguing that for much of life where you, you sit back. The problem is back to the serenity prayer, be active and take control of your life where it actually pays off. And this is an area where it doesn't. And as you say, it's cultural. It's the economy is built around that and our brains are wired from, from evolution. You talked about stoicism. That's why one of the uh, chapters has the sort of um, humorous subtitle, why Epictetus, one of the more famous Stoics, would choose a broccoli portfolio. And the point of that was so that any reader would look at it and just say, what are you talking about? <laughs> Greek philosopher, broccoli portfolio? The point is, the hard part of investing is not all the analysis and the research and staying up on things. The hard part of investing for most people is the discipline, let's call it the stoicism, to stick with a plan. And uh, there's a, a, a great comment from an author um, I quote in the book who said, good investing is actually about good habits, not skillful, savvy, clever research. And that's a that's a hard thing to learn. And it's, it's very similar. So I keep drawing the allusion to food, uh, allusion to food where we're wired to crave chocolate cake and it's hard to eat broccoli. Broccoli's boring. It's not exciting. It doesn't make our mouths explode. And I'm, I'm a baker. I make, um, I love baking chocolate cake. That's part of why I use that. I, and I, I, I love the sugar rush, but I also understand scientifically I better eat an awful lot of broccoli and just dabble a little bit in chocolate cake. And the problem with what the investment industry sells is so much of it is being sold as chocolate cake. Why? Because selling chocolate cake makes the investment industry a lot more money than selling broccoli. Okay. So selling chocolate cake is in their best interest, is revenue producing. And, and, it's, and it's not in yours. Right, right, right. So it takes a whole lot more discipline yeah. to, 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 to do less than to do more. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You're, 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 you're pulling on concepts from some great spiritual practices, especially, say, um, Zen Buddhism or, or, or the Stoics. That, yes. that, that discipline is hard. It's why I like to say, and this is commonly heard, indexing is simple, but it's not easy. And the part right. that's hard is not the intellectual challenge, it's the discipline. And that's the main, one of the main arguments of the book is inviting people to get past the assumption that the hard part of investing is all that time commitment and research and skills. The part that really pays off for most investors is constancy. It's, it's the stories you hear about the, 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 you know, the, the woman who died, who'd been a, 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 I think she'd been a cleaning woman all her life. She I forget where she lived uh, in East Coast City. And she had relatively low income and she died with like $6 million in her estate. And everyone just said, what, this woman must have been an investing genius. And she probably was good. But the biggest thing was she was buying stocks in like 1965 and she never sold them ever. She just hung on to them. That kind of discipline is what makes you rich, but that doesn't sound sexy and fun. It doesn't sound like this is some brilliant insight. If people could hear about my book and say, indexing, we already know about that. And that's a really valid point. I'm not claiming indexing is anything new. Lots of people do understanding. What I'm arguing for is look through to the combination of all that research on, on indexing versus active and all the research into our brains, the neuroscience, especially behavioral finance, which shows how we're hardwired, as I am. We're all hardwired to lean towards certain poor investment decisions. And so the, the trick is how to uh, avoid getting sucked in by the seductive sirens of active management, just like uh, dieting. I, I've, I've read that, I don't know if there's good research on this, that 
some of the um, diet programs that get sold, part of their success, if they have, if they have any, is is building a kind of social support network to cheer people on and to help get them through their discipline. It's incredibly hard to be disciplined around a diet. We're coded for survival to want to eat and to want to eat a lot. And when things, when times are are bad, if 300,000 years ago, you needed to eat a lot because you might be starving to death because of drought the next year or, or two months later. And similarly to investing, it's really hard to be disciplined. And that's why I like, love that idea of a, anything that can help that discipline, like a social support group almost to, to help people get through temptations, basically. I mean, it sounds very sort of um, almost like a, a 17th century uh, uh, you know, Puritan Christian mindset of the devil is going to tempt you. But that's kind of what's going on. The problem is that, that devil is, is inside us. It's, it's the temptation of how much fun and uh, uh, active management, all those sexy strategies. I, I've actually talked to people who've argued on this and they say, come on, active is so much more fun. And that one, I completely swear, abs they're absolutely right. Indexing is not more fun. It's dull but you end up with a lot more money. That's and, it takes, and it takes more discipline. Okay, yeah. so I absolutely agree with you on that, that making things simple is much harder than making things complicated. And people sometimes don't realize that the, the wisdom and the humility of, of staying to, on the simple but steadfast course is the winner, is a long-term winning game. Yep. And the, the humility is not actually tied to poverty, but tied to more wealth. Exactly. And it, 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 you, you use that word. It's, it's a great word choice. I'm actually writing a piece, a um, very short piece I'm going to be um, getting published soon, where I talk about humility and that you just mentioned that people associate it with, with poverty. You think of, of uh, you know, the Sisters of Mercy or Buddhist monks, whatever, that that's what humility is about. And the weird irony is that with investing, humility makes you a lot richer. And that sounds almost as though it's like you're spiritually polluting humility, but you're not. Humility is all about knowing what you can control and what you can't control and which skills you're good at and which you're bad at. And the problem is investors, this is very well documented, investors have a higher level of confidence in their abilities than are warranted. And there's an interesting gender angle there that men are worse at the overconfidence problem. Women are slightly better investors. There was just some recent uh, data, I believe Fidelity just published, but there've been other uh, articles that one I particularly like called boys will be boys. Men are slightly worse investors, not because women are smarter, because men, we think we can control things that we can't. And so women are doing better because they're doing less and the men are doing worse because there's that tweaking you were talking about earlier. That's what causes the trouble. So it's this fascinating shift of, of mindset and philosophy. That's the challenge of this message I'm trying to preach. Right. So historically, we evolved as humans from caves and men were hunters and women were were farmers they were with babies and they're collecting seeds and growing you yep. know uh, uh, harvesting yep. so yep. so we were programmed differently that's why men they are both blessed and cursed with the testosterone yeah, yeah. Which, and it's all yeah it's all blessed and cursed and, and you mentioned testosterone there's some great research that testosterone leads to worst investment decisions there's some great research that shows when women are given testosterone they start to become overconfident and make poor decisions. But again, this is all tricky. There are times when that uh, confidence and, and positive benefits from something like testosterone can be very helpful in certain situations. Investing is not one of them. So I'm not maligning males or to, hey, some of my best friends are men. I'm not maligning males or testosterone, but overconfidence is very dangerous in investing. And that's why I love that you you use that word humility around good investing because it's not a word most people associate with, with greater wealth. Right, now going back to your example of this, a very uh, low income woman, she was 
using this buy and hold, buy and yep. hold. Yep. And now here's my question. What if what she bought 30 years ago was actually a bad stock? It was the company went belly up. And uh, in that's, today's- that's, that's part of investing. You're, you're going to buy companies that go belly up. You, that's why you want to be diversified. So she didn't just buy one stock. She bought a number of, of companies and the, the key part there was that buy and hold. So when you do indexing, you are automatically owning the worst stocks in the stock market. And people think, well, that sounds stupid. I don't want to own the ones that are going to do the worst. And you are guaranteed to own the ones that are going to do the worst. Well, why would I do that? Because you picking the ones you think are going to do better has been proven to leave you with less money. Hiring and paying extra to a manager to do that for you is going to harm you even more. And it's, it's not as though active managers who get paid for it are the only ones who are bad at it. Individual investors, it's well documented, are not good at the active picking. So part of that stoicism, uh, uh, humility part is I acknowledge that I'm going to pick a bunch of stocks that do really badly. But overall, I am better off by just buying the entire market rather than trying to distinguish in advance which ones are going to be bad. Why do I say that? Because the data are so powerful supporting that trying to pick the ones that are going to do badly or do better that's what gets you lower returns. And that is such a paradox. It, it just sounds so counterintuitive. That's, that's the challenge. Okay. So Patrick, um, in Chinese, there's a saying called with no change at all, you deal with 10,000 changes. So in Mandarin, it's 一不变,一万变, okay? Which is the essence of your advocacy for passive versus active, okay? Uh, now here, you have to have the stomach to hold the good and the bad and ugly all in that index portfolio and not to pick out the rotten apples in your opinion and not to deal and not to clean out the bad and ugly and just sit and do nothing. Is that exactly good Lord. And that's, that's the discipline is we think we know how to pick the one. It's like going to an advisor and saying, why don't you just buy me the stocks that are going to go up? And the correct answer is, we don't have that ability. It's been well documented that on average, we don't have that ability. From time to time, some of us can. The, the, that's the really disturbing part the industry doesn't want people understanding. It's not that you can never beat the market. It's that it's a bad bet when you look at long uh, time periods and uh, across all active managers. Okay. And you did say in your book that uh, the fees charged based on active managing is uh, statistically proving uh, dragging down the performance comparing with the non-active, the passive without, you know, a higher fee. Right. Uh, and there's, and there, there are two components to that. One is you have to pay the active manager, what's called an asset manager. But the question arises, we were talking earlier about, should I do this myself or hire a wealth manager? If you're hiring a wealth manager to help you on financial planning and, and keeping you grounded and not panicking, or, or maybe you're, you procrastinate and you won't take care of your portfolio, those are all valid reasons. If you're hiring a wealth manager exclusively for the purpose of picking the active strategies that are going to outperform, that is a whole extra maybe 1% of fees that you can skip. So not only are you saving money paying the active asset manager, you can save money by not paying a wealth manager to pick active managers. And you can save more in the realm of like 2% when you throw all of that in. That's why it's very important to understand why are you hiring a wealth manager? What do you expect them to do for you. And as I argue in the book, there are really valid good reasons where to hire a, a wealth manager and they can add value. 
And then there's some really unjustifiable ones. And that's why I keep focusing on the, um, the active, uh, as we talked about earlier, either the stock picking or the active asset allocation. In other words, anyone trying to beat the market or time the market. That's where the track record is so awful. Right. Okay. Here is a very macro, broad question. So if everybody is investing in passive, in index, okay, how can the market ascertain the individual stock's value? Yep. Because yeah, that's a, that's a, a very valid um, concern. Um, however, in my experience, it's one raised only by those in the industry trying to defend their revenue from selling active management. What you're talking about is something that the, the jargon term for that is price discovery. And that means you put it more in plain English. How do I know what a given stock is worth if I don't have active people buying and selling? And that is completely valid. Active managers do serve that purpose but you don't have to pay them for it because there are so many doing it. Now, the debate is around how big can indexing get before that becomes a problem? And I would argue it can get really high. I conceivably it could be 90% of the market. You don't need all that much uh, active for good price discovery. The, the, the reason I object to that uh, that the pushback on that particular issue, it's a valid point, but it's a little weird to be saying, you shouldn't invest in active, or sorry, you shouldn't invest in indexing because if too many people did that, eventually it would be bad for indexing and active could start making money again. And that's just a very weird, wait a minute, if too many of us do this, it'll eventually not, work anymore and therefore we should be overpaying for active now in anticipation of maybe that happens that's a very weird i would say wrong headed foolish logical path especially since active managers should be happy if that happens because it means the opportunities are now available for them that 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 aren't historically where it hasn't paid to pay that extra, uh, those extra fees. It hasn't paid off. And so I consider that a very strange speculative, uh, although valid, intellectually valid point. Okay, it's like yin and yang of each other, you know, the active and the passive. It, there's, and it's not a realistic concern that the market will be completely static and- C Correct. Devoid, because there will be always- humans. Yes. Yes. Actively managing. It's yes. just like the stock market is a reflection of our humanities, yes. yep. the worst and the best. Uh, exactly. And, and I, I agree completely how you phrased it, that there will always be people trying to outsmart the market. That's the nature of the beast. And ironically, I'm saying that's fine to have all those people doing it. But you as an investor, if you're not sure you want to pay a lot of money for the effort to try and beat the market. Right now, the history is so overwhelmingly against active that you are much more likely to be wealthy, wealthier by taking this simpler approach. And that's for the common folks who don't have a lot of money, as well as for multimillionaires and billionaires. Absolutely. That, that's one of the, the myths I write about is yes. the, it's not as though indexing is just for um, for small investors or just for those without a lot of money, it's for people who focus on data rather than, than the emotional excitement of all those sexy strategies. Right. Okay. Now for retirement funds, such as a defined contribution like 401k, mm -hmm. do employees have any say in selecting the low fee index funds? Um, I know I heard of that this corruption, uh, sort of the small plans, very expensive funds uh, are offered uh, by employers and the employers don't pay the administrative fees, but employees out of their contribution, their hard yep. earned money. Yeah. And, and they are not, they don't even know. So and what do you think the employees uh, can, can do, do? What, are, what, are, what are their choices yeah uh, i'm not gonna have a great happy happy answer for that um 
the 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 four hundred and one k world is is good at most big companies. You can usually find some index choices. The the challenge is that, as you mentioned, the the smaller plans part of how they pay for it is to hire a financial advisor. They put in very, very expensive funds. And then the participants, the employees, they don't have any choice. They just have to pick from a lot of bad choices. My, my wife had a job about 15 years ago. She asked me to look at their 401k offerings. And I was like, these are all terrible. Oh, here's a bond fund that's okay. Put everything in that. And so um, you can talk to your HR people and and ask why don't we have low cost funds if there aren't any uh, a lot do include that and one of the things to remember in, in 401k world again it can be overwhelming i think there's research proving that you you have a 401k selection of say 80 different funds or 100 that's overwhelming and most people just look at it like, i have no idea and they pick a couple things just willy-nilly what the book recommends is own all of capitalism, get the, get the balance between your safer bucket and your risky bucket, get that right, index for the, for the stock side, and then you're pretty much set and don't tweak it. So the 401k world is, is like a, 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 a subset, but it's a really representative one of the entire investment world where there's some really greasy, unsavory stuff going on. The hidden fees in the 401k world, you think I sound preachy on investing in general? A 401k world is even more replete with these unsavory hidden fees. It is such a gross manipulation of workers trying to save for their retirement. I think it's unconscionable. Um, but there's some great plans out there and there's some uh, uh, good opportunities maybe to push with your HR folks. Can you please put in uh, some low cost choices? So you said Russell 3000 is a reliable index for almost the entire U.S. stock market, including large, medium, and small U.S. companies, yes. and, and saves tax and recalibration, okay, to further diversify globally into Asian market and other countries for both established and emerging markets. What indexes do you recommend, like the MSCI ACWI? Or uh, what is the advantage and disadvantage of having everything in one pot versus treating foreign stocks, the non-US stocks, in a separate pool? Yeah, a very, very interesting question and some interesting debate around how to do that. So the advantage of, of ACWI, the all country world index from MSCI, is that it is everything. I, I like to say you're buying capitalism. It's basically all publicly traded companies, including emerging markets, including foreign developed, including the US. The downside for some US investors is right now, I'm not positive the exact number, I think the US portion of that is around between 55 and 60% of the total. That's a pretty heavy allocation toward foreign. And some US investors could actually argue, well, wait a minute, my my expenditures, my liabilities are all going to be dollar denominated. So why should I own foreign? There is real benefit to diversification. And I would argue strongly against anyone who looks at foreign stocks versus US, say for the last, I don't know what the time period would be, 10, at least 10 years. US has done a lot better than foreign. That's not a good reason not to own foreign. So I, I suggest in the book, no less than 20% of your stock allocation be in foreign up to uh, whatever the ACWI weight is. Let's say that's around 40. Um, I actually split the difference for my own portfolio. I have a, a 70-30, 70 US 30. That's not a terribly scientific thing. Definitely should own some foreign. If you don't wanna deal with picking how much foreign, how much US, then ACWI is a great, default to you're, you're just owning capitalism you're you're deploying your assets the way that 95 trillion dollars is invested around the globe and it's a very smart thing to do to piggyback on all that wisdom right and the global market doesn't uh spread out evenly like uh after this uh ongoing decoupling so-called decoupling of the u.s china 
uh, you know, trade relationship. Um, people think India and Vietnam are the, the emerging, you know, stars, uh, so to speak, compare with the rest of the world. I mean, any foreign government bonds and stocks that you recommend? And do you think it's, it's a, a, a good move to pick certain countries versus a complete hodgepodge of global index funds? Joanna, I think you know how I'd answer that question. I know. Basically, let me rephrase, and then we'll see where the answer goes. Let me rephrase your question to saying, Patrick, do you think individual investors are smarter than that global pool of $95 trillion in picking which countries are, uh, which country stock markets are gonna do better or worse? And my answer is, I don't think you can pick individual stocks. I don't think you can pick regions. I don't think you can pick industries and I don't think you can pick individual countries. So what's so fun about Acqui is, if someone asks you, are you invested in Vietnam and India? Your answer is yes to, are you invested in any industry? Do you own small? Do you own large? Do you own US? Do you own foreign developed, foreign emerging? The answer is I own all of it because I bought a little tiny piece of all of them and I let the world's uh, giant traders. pool of wealth determine how I allocate across countries. And wow. okay. India and Vietnam may have great stories, but the problem is countries or industries that have great stories can also be overbought and overvalued. So I, I think I've shared this with you uh, previously, the idea of during the, the uh, internet uh, boom of the late 90s bubble, and it got overvalued as an industry. And people would push back and say, indexing, that's, that's silly. Don't you realize the internet is going to change the economy? And my answer was, of course, the internet's going to change the economy. That's absolutely true. Just like right now, you could say, what, AI is going to change the economy or climate change is going to change the economy. That's absolutely true. But that doesn't mean that the stock market is more foolish than you are at valuing which companies are going to benefit from that or which countries. So India and Vietnam may have great stories. I, I don't really know anything about where they are vis-a-vis -vis other um, emerging markets. But when you start thinking you're smarter than that collective pool of money, statistically, you are now heading for worse performance. That is what the data tell us. Got it. Because there are others who are speculating the same way and then overpricing and all the downfall. Okay. So today, as of today, today is January the 11th, 2022. There's inflation going on. There's interest rate is going to go up. What do you think uh, the U.S. Treasury bond, uh, is it still a good store of value? What impact will the inflation and the rising interest rate have for the stock market when you build a diversified portfolio? So I'll answer that question by going back to the 0809 financial meltdown. And in the middle of say 2009, interest uh, overnight interest rates, money market funds were basically at zero the way they are today. And, and longer bonds were very, very low. There was not a general consensus. There was virtually absolute certainty at that time. Bonds are a terrible investment. Everyone knows rates are going up. You can't own bonds. You need to get your lower risk elsewhere. And guess what? That was absolutely wrong. We are now, what, 13 years later? And... Um, you're hearing the same story. It's certainly true that inflation is putting enormous pressure on bonds. Real interest rates are quite negative. So bonds have a lot of risk uh, embedded in them. And I certainly think it's very plausible that bonds will be in for a rough period. Back to the same mantra you keep hearing me preaching though. You're better off not trying to outsmart all of those moves. I don't recommend bonds for the diversification versus stocks, although that, that does add some benefit. I recommend it because in terms of behavioral finance, 
psychologically, it's very, very difficult to be able to endure 100% stock allocation and ride that thing down 50% as happened in the, uh, the 1990, sorry, the uh, 2000, 2002 intercom, uh, sorry, internet um, uh, meltdown and the financial in 2008, 2009. So bonds are, are for me a psychological crutch to help shore up your panic and allow you to endure and stick with your asset allocation that mathematically for a 20, 30, 40 year horizon, maybe should be 100% stocks, but that's for a robot. Human beings often don't operate that way. I don't operate that way. I actually have what most people would consider a very wimpy portfolio. They would look at my safe, safer or component and just say, you're being silly. Uh, that, that's my call. I understand that risk. I understand what I'm leaving, leaving on the table. It's all about what you can endure psychologically. So to your, answer your question, inflation is a very real issue. And it does suggest that bonds are generally a very bad asset to hold um, during high inflation. Uh, stocks aren't ideal, but they're a lot better because they're tied to the real economy. And so does that mean you should tweak your asset allocation over inflation expectations? No, because that's another form of market timing. And that's why I urge everyone, pick your asset allocation that fits who you are and stick with it. Don't get caught up in the short-term news that's so seductive, but we have data gets us into trouble. So uh, long-winded answer to your question on bonds, but it's just like everything else. As soon as you think you can outsmart the market, you're in trouble. That's a red flag. Right. Okay. So what? where is the better than bank place for storing cash? Emergency funds. Okay. Is there an, another place that yields a better interest rate and hopefully uh, not so much lower than inflation? Uh, what's the reasonable range of interest for storing cash for yeah. money market funds or yep. muni money market funds? Yeah, and that's a great question. And that moves around over time. So um, let's look at the last uh, 30 years. So going back to 1992. So for the period uh, uh, 1992, uh, I believe through the, uh, through the, the dot-com meltdown all the way up to the financial crisis, Money market funds were a lot better place to hold your cash than banks. And banks were just not very competitive. And, and everybody sort of understood that. Then when the uh, Federal Reserve had to take interest rates to zero as a way to basically help save the economy in, in the 0809 uh, um, collapse, suddenly there were a few banks that because they wanted to attract deposits would offer what sounds like a really bad interest rate, but compared to zero is great. And, and today it's the same situation. There are a few banks that might be paying as high as, as half a percent compared to a, a, a money market fund paying zero. What's really interesting is right now, there are some opportunities in what I would call a kind of gray area between money markets and ultra short bonds things with a maturity of say nine months, a year, 15 months. And in the last couple months, those have actually started paying higher interest rates. They were paying as much as 0.6% or even for like a year and a half, 0.8%. And that's relatively low, what's called duration risk, interest rate change risk, but is paying uh, uh, an attractive return. So. A lot of it depends on why are you holding cash? Most people need to hold cash for an emergency fund. That should be at a bank or a money market fund. Probably not in one of these short-term things. If you're holding some bonds, but you're very concerned about this interest rate risk, the inflation risk, you can go very, very short. What I'm talking about, this kind of between money markets and, and short bond, short maturity bonds, and there are some actually interesting opportunities there right now, but that's the kind of thing you do need to check from time to time because I think uh, a, a year ago, those were paying a lot less and not as 
interesting. So you're taking a tiny bit of the inflation interest rate risk, but um, it's so small that it's pretty close to a money market in terms of risk. Now about ESG investing, you know, we all have our emotional bias, information bias and cognitive, uh, yeah, dissonance, yeah. cognitive dissonance. dissonance. Uh, there are people who exclusively invest in ESG. They fall in love with certain type of investment. Uh, so what do, we, what do you think? What, what's your opinion, personal opinion? What's your professional opinion? Yeah. So, so. I've got some bias because I've worked in the ESG space. ESG, of course, stands for Environmental Social Governance. It used to be called SRI, Socially Responsible Investing. Sometimes it's called Impact Investing. So to the basic question, should an investor follow uh, an ESG approach? My answer is grounded in if you're doing it in expectation of outperformance, that's a bad idea. Why? Because it's ESG? No, because it's active. However, there are people who want their portfolio to reflect their value set, and they want to feel good about the companies they own. And I think some skeptics would say that's silly. It makes no difference. It may make a difference to the investor. And so ESG can be a very... Um, solid, reputable way to invest, but you need to bring the same skepticism you do to non-ESG investing. Focus a lot on the fees. Do not get seduced by uh, ESG outperforming. I've seen a lot of ESG investors who presume that because companies are acting more ethically, they're going to perform better financially. There's some data that that might be true, but it's not very reliable. And so I'm very comfortable and supportive of ESG investing. I'm not comfortable of ESG as a means to outperform. And one of the things we've seen in the industry is ESG has gotten so popular in the last, say, five years. It was becoming popular in 2017. It's exploded. And what's happened is the investment industry has seen that and is sort of uh, licking its chops, thinking, gotta love all that money because a lot of ESG is active. And it's one of the few areas where fund flows uh, have, have been positive for active management is in the ESG space. So ESG on its merits, very supportive, open eyes, make sure you know what you're getting into, be very careful about fees, be very careful about active. Right. And so same principles apply before you're emotionally get seduced into it. You know, like the Elizabeth Holmes trial, that's, you know, lots of famous people, you know, George Schultz and the, the Henry Kissinger and, the, you know, they fail too, just like all of us doing due diligence. And, and uh, good, good choice of verb that they were maybe seduced. There was a, just a, a mystique around that company that, um, you know, and, and they were good at selling. Elizabeth Holmes was very good at, at selling that story. And a lot of people are good at selling the story of their friend. And a court just decided, no, that is not just trying to um, uh, do well in a, in a private equity investment. That's actually breaking the law. Right. So always check the ROI, check the diversification of risk, you know, the fees and the, all the other, uh, the substances before. And, and, and the way, actually, the way you just articulated it is uh, you talk about it, about the, the seduction, check your own emotions, check whether or not you're getting seduced something because you want to believe in it. And that's true for active management in general. It's certainly true for stories like you were just talking about, should, shouldn't I invest in Vietnam and India? It's very seductive to feel as though you're in a sort of elite investing mode that knows how to capitalize on these things. And that's part of the danger of, of active investing in general. And certainly since you were just talking about uh, what, what the courts found was in fact a, a, a more 
dishonest offering of a, a, a company, a startup that was claiming to do things it couldn't. So it's a very tricky balancing act. I think one of the things people do with a company like Theranos is presume that it would have been very easy to spot that it was not on the up and up. And it's not always that easy. It, it's tricky to, to figure out when you're getting seduced and when you're being uh, hard edged and just following the numbers. And back to the other word you used earlier, humility, huge benefit in investing where, um, like for example, could I have been hearing a pitch for a company like that and been swayed by it? I'm actually easily, I, I sound very sort of cynical and skeptical and hard edge, but it's actually because I'm kind of gullible in a lot of ways. I want to believe people. I want to believe stories. It's very exciting. And so I, one of the dangers, actually one of the uh, uh, research uh, findings out of behavioral finance on what are called biases, one of them is called hindsight bias. And what that means is when you hear about something, like the example you raised this Theranos, people presume, well, I would have spotted that. I knew that was coming and I predicted it. And if you actually keep track of your predictions, no, we're, we're bad at predicting. We just think we're good at it. And hindsight bias fills in the gaps in the past because it makes us feel better. And I've heard people talk about uh, situations like that and say how they would have sussed it out. And I'm, I'm not so sure. I think humility is a, a great companion for investing. Right. Another danger to sound mindedness is the group psychology, the yes. fear, the fear yep. of missing out. Yep. Yeah. Just because so and so who I uh, the, the world assumes have a better brain, smarter mind is doing this. And therefore, it must be a good investment. No, exactly. And, and, and history is replete with what they're called bubbles. They go back uh, the. I'm sure they go back many centuries. The first really famous ones from the 17th century in the Netherlands. It was a very famous, it was called the South Sea Bubble in, um, in uh, England in the 18th century. The, the Dutch one was, was called tulip mania. And people think, yeah, we're a lot more sophisticated. We've gotten past that. We're the same biological organism. We have the same mindset. And so when you talk about that fear of missing out, you're capturing that allure of being cool and smart, you're, you're in on uh, developments, you're on top of things, and you're going to get richer than other people. And you're watching someone, evidence of someone who just got wealthy, and you're thinking, why can't I get a piece of that? And it's very smart to apply that to the stock market and capitalism in general. It's not for individual companies, individual countries, or you know, crazy new asset classes that are evolving bring a lot of danger that they're not well vetted and they may sound really sexy, but in fact are uh, examples of bubbles like like the, the ones I've been talking about historically. Right. Now, we all are humans. We all um, have the rational, logical side, and we have our impulsive side, the, the risk-taking side. Well put, so, exactly. Yes, yeah, so maybe, what do you think of this strategy that 95% of your investment, you have a disciplined, indexed, board-based. Yeah. And maybe if you want to have some thrill-taking- yeah. your, 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 your play money. You pay money, yeah, yep. get some play money, and yep. uh, play with uh, Bitcoin yep. and uh, you know yep. non fungible tokens, yep. Yep. and and pick a stock that you like. Yep. But if you lose, you don't lose, you know, right. the bulk of it. So uh, in the book, I actually say, I obviously sound like such an indexing purist, and even for someone like me, that is so minor an impact on your wealth and your portfolio. That's fine. I've actually had someone argue with me, a, a, a wealth manager I really respect. And he shared the view that investors may do better sticking to the 95% if you allow them the fun and the play of the 5%. In effect, he was saying back to the broccoli and chocolate cake, he was saying, You'll have a healthier diet in terms of behavior if you allow people a little chocolate cake. If it's all broccoli, they'll feel as though they live in a prison or a monastery or a nunnery and just rebel. 
And I was fascinated. I'd never heard that interpretation. And I was fascinated by it and a little bit persuaded that, come on, we all need to have a little bit of fun. And you sound like this dour Calvinist Puritan by scolding us and saying we should only index. He didn't, he didn't phrase it that way. But that's a very interesting angle. So especially the number you named, 5%, uh, absolutely go and have your, your fun. And in a way, you're being very self-aware when you carve out 5% of your portfolio. You're saying, look, I want to have a good time. I want to research some stocks. I want to buy some crypto. Fine. You're acknowledging that the odds are not in your favor, but you're not such a, a, a disciplined purist and a, and a monk that you're going to uh, not have any fun at all. So I'm not only open to that, I, I've been uh, nudged that I should actually be supportive of that because I find that a very fun angle. Right. Not, too much, too much, uh, no, no chocolate cake at all actually is going to make you uh, blow through crave, your diet. Make and, you and, crave and, it more. Yeah, yeah, yes. exactly. Okay, so I'm really impressed that uh, 100% of the proceeds from this book, you are going to donate to uh, financial literacy, uh, a great cause because there, I hope someday the public schools and private schools will have curriculum about financial literacy. I mean, it's we have generations of Americans who don't know yeah. how to manage their money. Okay, yeah. so I would like to give you a parting gift, you know, that I do to all my honored guests um, because I, I'm a branding expert. So I try to summarize their brand with fewer than five words. Okay. Okay, and usually it's what does your brand stand for? Yeah. Uh, summarizing uh, what I read about you, what we chatted about. Yeah. Is it a good description if I say Patrick Gaddis brand stands for a passion for truth based I, on your obsession with I, telling the truth? I, I love it. And it, of course, ties directly to the, the company I co-founded in 1999, Aperio. That's a Latin verb that means to make clear, to reveal the truth. So not only would I agree, I, I love that brand label, Joanne, and I will uh, try and even use that. What's your brand about? It's about passion, for, passion for the truth. Yes, uh, honesty, integrity, and the genuine care for people. And, and uh, uh, yeah, get clear, get 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 to the bottom of it, you know, and take pleasure in pointing out falsity <laughs> and, and yeah, falsity, <laughs> BS basically. Yeah, okay. exactly. That's, it's wonderful. Uh, thank you so much. Oh, uh, it's been my pleasure. Yes, this is an eye-opening book for me personally and for a lot of people. And you definitely have contributed. Uh, I, in my opinion, uh, more than your remarkable success to humanity, you have contributed this gem of wisdom that will benefit countless uh, consumers and investors. Well, I, I, I hope that's an accurate description. I hope it plays out that way. I, I aspire for have, to, to have it work out that way because that was part of the motivation is I've been blessed. Um, how do you, how do you re repay a debt like that? And so I hope I hope you're right. You, you articulate it uh, beautifully. So thank you very much. Thank you. See you another time. All right. Thanks. Sure. All right.